we know the nervous system, mainly the nervous system is three primary functions. The sensory input it comes through the nerve and it integration at the end of, uh, nerve endings and the junctions and then the motor output where the muscles or everything works out. So we know that the nervous system has uh, two parts, mainly central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. And peripheral nervous system is again divided into afferent or sensory division, efferent or motor divisions. And this motor division is again uh, divided into somatic and autonomic nervous system, which is again divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So you all know this. We, uh, and how a neural transmission occurs. When uh, we know that, I'll, I'll go through this quickly because we all know this is just, just to remind ourselves that what happens. When a nerve impulse reaches the exon terminal, mainly the chain of events occurs at the exon terminal and also at the neuromuscular junction. This, uh, when the nerve impulse comes, the neurotransmitters that are stored in the end of the muscle, end of the nerves, are released are synthesized, are released, whatever we call this from vesicles. It goes into the synaptic cleft or neuromuscular junction, whatever we call it. And then it binds to the post-junctional receptors where it acts. And this act, this binding with the post-junctional receptor then changes the permeability of the post-synaptic membrane where the sodium channels and the channels that open and their uh, the excitatory or inhibitory, whatever the impulse is or whatever the junction is made for, that happens. And, and then what happens, the neurotransmitter that causes all this action is again removed from the post-synaptic membrane very quickly by enzymatic degradation. And some of it is reuptake again into the presynaptic neuron and again uh, it uh, manufactures the neurotransmitter which is mainly acetylcholine. The more intense the stimulus, the greater frequency of the uh, neurotransmitter release and the greater, uh, greater the action of the motor endpoint and the muscles. Okay. So uh, there's mainly as I, uh, when a transmission occurs, there are two mainly actions. There's pre-junctional events, if we call the junctions as the uh, divider between the nerve and the uh, muscle, pre-junctional events, which is mainly in the nerve, and the post-junctional events, which is mainly in the mus muscle or postsynaptic membrane. What happens in pre-junctional events? Mainly the three things, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is synthesized, acetylcholine is stored, and acetylcholine is released. These are the main functions at the pre-junctional events. Uh, we know that acetylcholine is synthesized from choline and acetyl coenzyme A in the exoplasm in the presence of an enzyme, which is choline acetyltransferase. And then this acetylcholine is stored in the vesicles in the, at the end of the nerve in three different store facilities. The releasable store, which is mainly 80%, which, which it's situated at the end of the muscles near the membrane. The stationary store, which is about 20%, which remains a little behind that. And there is also called a surplus store. The surplus store, we cannot see it uh, where it is, but when we uh, give stimulation, the nerve by pyridostigmine or physostigmine, not neostigmine, by physostigmine, then we see an a huge amount of acetylcholine coming in from nowhere. This is the surplus store. And then the acetylcholine is released. These are two ways of releasing, mainly two theories, the spontaneous release and the vocal release. Spontaneous release is when the vesicles are touching the membrane, then it releases itself and it produces the miniature end plate potential. And when the nerve impulse comes, there is a huge quanta of acetylcholine is released, which is the evoke response. And this evoke response in presence of miniature end plate potential pro produces actually the end plate potential.
And now the post-junction elements. What happens post-junction elements? We know that this is the nerve terminal. Uh, the this is the nerve coming, and this is the uh, nerve membrane, and this is the post-synaptic membrane. The membrane at the muscle. These are synaptic clefts. But the here the uh, uh, receptors are situated, and this is the and these are the uh, in to increase the surface area. This site is also known as motor and plate, and acetylcholine molecules bind here in order to activate the receptor. And the activation of the receptor will create an end plate potential, as I have said, and induce muscle contraction. So what, what are the steps leading to a single muscle contraction? First, we need the arrival action potential, which is, uh, comes from the, either from the brain or spinal cord to the motor end, the terminal of the motor neuron. Then, in response to this action potential, vesicles within the exons, they release the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Uh, as I have already mentioned, and then the acetylcholine diffuses across the cleft and binds to the specific receptors, acetylcholine receptors that are present in the end plate of the postjunctional muscle cell. And then this step receptors are stimulated, and acetylcholine causes this uh, end plate to depolarize or opens the channel, and sodium goes in, or whatever uh, response it's required. This end plate potential then triggers a series of biochemical events, as I've already mentioned, uh, which causes the muscle fiber to contract. We know that this exon branches of the nerve uh, are branching into numerous terminals. So each forming a neuromuscular junction, that is, uh, we call it a motor end plate, which contains many, many neuromuscular junctions. So the total motor end plate, when a nerve is stimulated, the total motor end plate is stimulated and the total muscle is stimulated in that case. The action potential is usually short-lived and because uh, the acetylcholines are uh, immediately hydrolyzed and during the polarization and the repolarization of it. Uh, acetylcholine is inactivated by acetylcholine esterase which, and this, the, membrane again comes to a resting phase. Here, if we visualize this picture, we can see that choline with acetyl coenzyme A forms choline and the, uh, co uh, coenzyme A and acetyl choline. This acetyl choline is, goes to the uh, vesicles, where in presence of ATP and calcium, it comes out. And when it is break down, it is breaks it breaks down here into choline and acetate, and this choline again goes into the in the uh, nerve terminal and again uh, forms the acetylcholine. So this is and these are this acts not only on the nicotinoid receptor; it can also act in postsynaptic receptors like nicotinic mask and P2 or peptidogen. The, the same thing happens in So this is again. A picture with, uh, if we this we summarize everything that just uh, the muscle nerve ending, the synthesis and storage of acetylcholine here, and then mobilization, mobilization comes towards the membrane, and then release it releases through the membrane, and. How a sodium channel works. We know that if, if we see this, this is a sodium channel, and then we see that this green bar is the voltage gate. We know that it has two gates, two gated theory of Mills Act, which revolutionized the sodium channel and also the neuromuscular junction, how it acts. The voltage gated channel is the green one, and the time gated channel is the red one. So voltage gated channel is always dependent on the voltage change of the inside and outside. And the time gated channel is maintained by time. It, at definite time intervals, it closes and it opens. So, whenever these two are open, only then the ions can go inside and ions can go outside. Otherwise, it cannot. Only single channel open cannot do that. 
here in the resting state, we see that both are uh, the time time gated opens and closes, but the voltage gated is closed. But when in the active stage, when the uh, ion voltage ions are increased here, the voltage gated opens, and the, when the time gated opens, only then sodium can comes in. And after some time, after its finite time, the time gated is closed here again. And even if the voltage gated is open, the, uh, it can it is not working, so it becomes an inactive again. So that here. With this figure, the depolarization occurs, and when this uh, this comes, the voltage time gated uh, is closed. The inactive sodium channel becomes inactive, and repolarization occurs. Now, we uh, we go to the main muscle relaxants. So if we go to the history of muscle relaxants, something. So before the advent of neuromuscular blocking agents, we know that surgical muscle relaxation was used to be done by administering large amounts of general anesthetics. So what happened during that time? They, uh, and we also know that there's a produced dangerously deep levels of anesthesia and patients, patients used to die. But in 1942, when the introduction of neuromuscular blocking agents first uh, came into the uh, this uh, to us. The we we the anesthesiologists then achieved that surgical muscle relaxation is possible, and with that surgical muscle relaxation, the dose of the general anesthetics became smaller, and the patients were better uh, managed. The we know that the first uh, neuromuscular drug that came into uh, us, this tuberculin, which came from the uh, South American poison tip arrows, and the, from there it came to England and also came to US and Canada, where the first person to make tuberculin from that poison was King, and then in 1942, in the homeopathic hospital in Montreal, Griffith and Johnson was the first. They are called, they are called the father of muscle relaxants because they were, they introduced curare into the anesthetic practice. This contributed greatly to the end of era, which anesthesia was reversible intoxication rather than the result of controlled drug action. In their first operations, Griffith and Johnson gave only just enough muscle relaxants to provide some surgical relaxation, but at the same time allow spontaneous respiration because around that time the tracheal intubation was not very popular because they didn't know it and that resulted in two different schools of thought in north america where uh, they first used this immediately after some time it was seen that the use of muscle relaxants were not were not many fold were not much because they did not intubate the patient, intubate the trachea and the patient. So there was an almost six-fold increase in mortality because they, they were uh, kept on spontaneous, but the dose of the muscle relaxants were not known around that time. So the patients used to die. But in Europe, on the other hand, when they used, mainly it was used by Gray. Or we have read their books. You have also read their book. is Gray and Nuns Gray. He first did that uh, he used the tracheal intubation and in Europe and England mainly, they were using muscle relaxants at random with tracheal intubation. So what's the primary effect of neuromuscular blocking drugs is know that we relax the skeletal muscle mainly here and this relaxation produces a flexor of paralysis so that the surgeons can do their surgeries anywhere in the body. Neuromuscular blocking agents do not readily cross the blood brain barrier, and so they are safe and they uh, act, they have little or no effect on the central nervous system activity. So they, they mainly act on the peripheral nervous system in the neuromuscular. Uh, they don't have anything to do with unconsciousness of the patient or pain or anything, they only paralyze, paralyze the patient. So after all this, after all this uh, invention and everything and with so many muscle relaxants around, 
what is the ideal neuromuscular blocking agent? So there are there needed to be many things for a muscle relaxants to be called ideal. This has to be a non-depolarizing mechanism of action. I'll tell this, uh, tell something about it a little later. It should be rapid onset of action. Why rapid onset of action? Because if we don't, if it is not rapid, then uh, the uh, danger of if we cannot put the tracheal tube inside, and if it is delayed, we have to do a mass ventilation, then there may be a problem and the patient is in danger. So uh, the onset should be as soon as possible. The duration should be less because if we fail to intubate the patient so that the, we can ventilate the patient and patient comes back quickly, is, is all for patient safety, should be rapid recovery. Uh, 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 non-cumulative. So if we add muscle relaxants in different doses, it should be non-cumulative. It should act only the dose that we give. Should not have any cardiovascular side effects, no histamine release. It should be reversible by any drugs. I say any drugs because it's not only choline steroids. There are other drugs which reverses uh, the muscle relaxants. Should be of high potency and should produce pharmacologically inactive metabolites after metabolism. So these are the criteria for an ideal muscle relaxation. So till today, we don't have anything that, uh, any muscle relaxation that we can call ideal because we have either one or two, we don't have three, four, five, or we have three, four, five, we don't have one or two. There's some problems is, always present. So when we classify the neuromuscular blocking agents, we can classify according to many, many uh, criteria. If we uh, classify on the precise mechanism of action, we can classify it into depolarizing agents and non-depolarizing agents. Depolarizing agents mainly we tell that when it acts on the neuromuscular junction, it deep, uh, depolarizes the muscle and then it never repolarizes. So the muscle uh, remains paralyzed for some time. And in depolarizing, non-depolarizing one, it depolarizes and again depolarizes so that the muscle, muscle action comes back and again we have to give muscle relax. Uh, the depolarizing agents are mainly still today, there are uh, many tried, but only succinylcholine is the only one that we can use. And we have many non-depolarizing agents. And there are other criteria of classification. We can classify the muscle reactions according to their uh, time of action, a short duration, uh, duration of action that is maybe short, intermediate, and high. We can uh, classify according to their uh, structures the benzyl isoquinolonian drugs and the amino steroids. The, these are the various ways of classifying the drugs. Uh, mainly the non-depolarizing that we can say the non-depolarizing can, can based on the chemical structure be divided into two groups. As I've said, benzyl isoquinolonian agents, these are the tubercurin, meticurin, atracurin, mevacurium group of drugs, and the amino steroids is the pancurinium, vecurinium, locurinium. And there was another one, rapacurinium, which was discontinued due to side effects. The other classification according to their duration of action, uh, the other classification is according to their onset of action, uh, rapidly onset and uh, intermediate onset. There are many ways we can classify. So how mechanism of action, the non-depolarizing one, the pre-junctional acetylcholine receptors, we have no, we know that what happens in the pre-junctional events. The first action is the acetylcholine receptors. They differ from the post-junctional nicotinic receptors, stimulation of these receptors on the post-junctional membrane by release of acetylcholine produces an end plate potential and thereby triggers, triggers a train of events that lead to contraction. Uh, blocking, we know that this is the normal physiology. And then blocking of these receptors, blocking of these receptors to acetylcholine cannot be, we stop 
the the uh, depolarization and depolarization so that the mus muscles are totally paralyzed stimulation of the prejunction receptors by release acetylcholine enhances mobilization as the, we all know that and oh there's another way of uh, okay this is the postjunctional receptor we know that a receptor can contains five units, five protein subunits as a post-junction receptor receptors. We know that it contains of uh, five subunits of protomars. These are called two alphas, beta, delta, and in adult, this is a, one is epsilon. And in uh, fetal receptor, this is uh, GABA. This is usually a gamma one, which is changes some of its uh, characters and becomes epsilon. These five protomars surround a central core, which is the mainly the ion channel. And the two alpha subunits are the places where the acetylcholine, these are the binding sites where the acetylcholine actually attaches itself. But even if these are two same subunit alpha, the characteristics of these two subunits are not the same. Why is that? Because we, if we go back to the previous picture, we can see that here is one alpha and here is one alpha. But this alpha is surrounded by one beta and one epsilon. And this alpha is surrounded by one delta and one epsilon. So the characteristics of this alpha and this alpha is not the same due to this surrounding two units. These are the two attaching uh, uh, subunits where the molecule actually attaches itself. So what happens? Uh, the acetylcholine molecule comes, it attaches here, one, two, and then it opens. And if we can block this, the channel doesn't open the, and the uh, ion cannot transmit through this place and the muscle here cannot de repolarize and becomes flaccid. Uh, this is the mainly those action of the uh, neuromuscular blocking agents. I'm not doing the individual drugs because that, that will take enough of my time if I cannot finish it today. <laughs> so, and these actions of this neuromuscular agents de uh, depends on some clinical conditions. Uh, and for these clinical conditions uh, of the drugs, pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics can change. It can increase or decrease the uh, timing of the relaxant. And uh, my action, my main work during my thesis was done on acid-base balance and also action of uh, different inhalation anesthetics like sevoflurane and isoflurane and enflurane on different muscle relaxants. So acid-base balance, when I use acid-base balance, we know that amino steroids uh, are during uh, acidic state, the amino steroids action increases and in alkaline stage, the amino steroid action is uh, decreased. But it is not true for benzyl isoquinolone uh, drugs. So there is difference be between the structural types of drugs and also on the clinical conditions. The actions of muscle relaxant may be changed due to renal disease, liver disease, acid base balance, I've already said, electrolyte balance, barn injuries, neuromuscular disease, age, and if we use other medications, like if we use uh, gentamicin with aminos, uh, aminos gentamicin like that, the actions usually increase. Now, we'll talk something about the monitoring of the neuromuscular drug. This is, this is very important monitoring of the neuromuscular block. So this is, uh, and uh, when we use muscle relaxant actually on a patient, when the patient is anesthetized, the monitoring should be a must because 
I, I'll tell you why uh, in course of this. So when monitoring started, monitoring of the dural muscular function started since 1958 when Christian uh, Churchill Davidson, the book that we did, this Churchill Davidson uh, first described how peripheral nerve stimulators could be used for this purpose. And it again increased in 1970 when train of four was introduced by Ali. We all know about train of four. So the train of four was introduced in 1970 by Ali. And the monitoring started from there. Recently, the monitoring of the neuromuscular function has become more and more a part of the routine observations on the anesthetized patients. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, when I was doing my uh, PhD, I have gone through many papers for my uh, uh, work. So there, I, I, and I was doing actually, because when I was, I was actually doing a phase three trial of rocuronium, because rocuronium was uh, just started coming to Japan around that time, and I was involved in the phase three of that uh, drug. So uh, when I read, uh, I've gone through many studies. At, at one study, we have seen that the muscle relaxants were given by two persons. One, by the anesthetist himself, according to his uh, desire, whenever he wanted, because he knew that muscle relaxants works for 20 minutes, and every 20 minutes he kept on giving some drug. And the other group, that group gave, uh, gave the muscle relaxant according to the choice of the surgeon. Whenever the surgeon wanted, that surgeon saw that in abdominal cases, the surgeon said that abdominal is tight, you give some muscle relaxant. And when it was compared, it was seen that when the muscle relaxants were given according to surgeon's choice, the muscle relaxants requirement was very less. So uh, the monitoring is very important. So because without giving it randomly, we should monitor and give according to requirement. So. And why, why, what do we know with monitoring? We know the precise degree of neuromuscular block at any time of the during throughout the total anesthesia. And we can also know that when it is the uh, time for tracheal intubation, when it's time for extubation, when it is time for give the repeat dose and it also allows to control, allow control the depth and duration of the block and determine when a reversal agent should be given. So everything we will know if we only monitor the muscle relaxant that we are using. So as I say, it, we can see the time for intubation of the trachea, the degree of relaxation, the time to give a reversal agent, the time for extubation, and the existence of possible residual cruelization. This is very important, the last point, because we often see the residual cruelization in the post-anesthesia care room. And this, uh, this is still a problem throughout the world. And that's, that is the only, that, as I said, when we produce an ideal muscle relaxant, we need to have something which does not read and need reversal and which does not produce possible residual polarization. Residual polarization is a problem that we must uh, take care of and for this we need to monitor. And what are the other causes? Interventions of long duration. Uh, when a, uh, it is used for a long surgical interventions or in the intensive care unit, monitoring helps to avoid very deep block because in some cases we don't need deep block. We only need uh, a, 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 a block which is okay for the surgery or which is okay for the patient to be in the intensive care. We don't need a uh, block which is very deep. And then in uh, patients with uh, change pharmacokinetics, that patients with renal or hepatic disease, we need to give a little less uh, muscle relaxants, we will know by this monitoring. 
we don't need the patient to move or straining where in the in in some surgeries in abdominal surgery if the patient moves then it is not much of a problem but in any eye surgery or in a, any neurosurgery if the patients move then they, there is going to be a very big problem so we have to know how much uh, relaxations we need at what time and then role reversal in some patients, reversal agents may be because we use anticholinic steroids, which is uh, other, which has other side effects. So in some patients, we should not use all those reversal agents. So in those patients, we need to know when the reversal actually occurs and uh, there is no post uh, recolorization. Right? If there is any disturbed electrolyte balance in patients or any there is any expected dark green interaction. As I've said, mentioned, tried to mention that monitoring, it increases safety. Monitoring of neuromuscular allows the anesthesiologist to be aware of the degree of relaxation and anti time during the operation. Understanding the patient can lead to undesirable patient's movements. We also know that. And because overdoses can be avoided, as, as I have said, we don't give according to time, we give according to need. And that uh, causes the incidence of residual polarization is much less and the optimal time to administer a reversal agent. Then it re reduces the cost. Uh, when I was visiting a hospital in Canada, I was surprised to see the prices of all the muscle relaxants are pasted on the anesthesia machine, nothing else, only the name of the muscle relaxants and the price of the muscle relaxants. So they wanted to make sure that we, the anesthetist uses the correct drug and correct doses so that because they, they wanted to show that the muscle relaxants are the one drug that costs more than any other drugs in uh, anesthesia. So what are the types of monitoring? We have a few types of monitoring, single twitch, train of four, tetanic stimulation, post-tetanic count, and double bus stimulation. So what is single twitch? A single twitch method measures the response to a single supramaximal electrical stimuli. And what is the supramaximal electrical stimuli? A supramaximal electrical stimuli is supposed to be a stimulus that produces or that releases all the acetylcholine that are present at the nerve ending. In fact, that finishes off the releasable 80%, the stores 20%, and also acts on the surplus store that is present. So all the acetylcholine present should be removed. Uh, that is called a supramaximal electrical stimulus. So whenever we are using a peripheral nerve stimulator to produce a supramaximal stimulus, it is very painful. The patient should always be unsedated when we use the supramaximal electrical stimulus. And when we used a single twitch, it is usually 0.1 hertz every 10 seconds or 1 hertz every second. So the, the one that we are usually using is 0.1 hertz every 10 seconds. This is the picture in the top. These are the stimulation, 0.1 hertz every 10 seconds. These are a square wave, supramaximal square wave impulses. These are all square wave impulses, stimulation. And this is the action. This is the twitch of the muscle. Here with this arrow, we uh, show that the muscle relaxant is given here. So when we give the muscle relaxant, we, the, this action and the block started, and we see there is a decrease in the twitch, and by three minutes, there's total block. This is, this is called fade, and for non-depolarizing drugs, the fade occurs. And also depolarizing drugs, there's no fade, but this occurs. And we see that this is increasing here, so the duration of the total muscle relaxation is around 25 minutes. And then there is increase again the single twitch. And what is now train of four? 
train of four is the most common method of monitoring. This is, this is almost the best method of monitoring if you have a machine. Train of four is, again, four supramaximal stimuli are applied every 0 0.5 seconds. Two hertz of supramaximal stimuli every 0 0.5 seconds at 0.5 seconds interval, two hertz of four stimuli. And this is called a train of four. Four stimulus are given after every 0.5 seconds so that of two hertz, that is called a train of four, because it is given as a train, four, four stimulus together. And this can be repeated every 12 to 15 seconds. And what, what, what do we monitor? When we give this, we see, when we see in uh, eyes, we see a response in the thumb. We see the four stimulus in the thumb. And what we actually do see mainly four stimulus, that is one. And the other thing is we see the ratio of the first stimulus and the fourth stimulus, and we call it the train of four ratio. This, the relationship of the fourth to the first response is the ratio, and this is the main thing that we want to see. So here we see that there's four stimulus is given every 10, 15 seconds and response. This is, there's two pictures I'm showing you here. This is one is non-depolarizing block, where I have said there's no fate because there's normal stimulus. We give the muscle relaxants and all four are gone together, just vanishes. And then when it comes, it comes one, two, and all four comes almost together. Sorry, this is non-depolarizing. And this is depolarizing on four vanishes together and comes all together. There's no fade. But in non-depolarizing one, the spore goes one after another. And when it comes back, it comes one and then two and then comes back again. And this first stimul first uh, response with the last response B by A is the train of four ratio. And when we have a machine, the machine calculates the ratio and it is expressed in either uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.7, which means uh, 0 0.7 means in 70% recovery or 0 0.1 means 10% recovery, something like that. So how do we do it? Before a muscle relaxant is given, the train of four ratio will be one because we know that all four stimulus and all four responses will be same. So B by A will be one, same response. So under an impartial non-depolarizing block, a fade of the response occurs, as I said, and the fade provides the basis for our evaluation. The ratio of the fourth response to the first is known as the P of four ratio. And the, as I said, the ratio can be expressed in figures or percentage, either 0 0.7 or 70%, something like that. Uh, but when we see in our only eyes, it is very difficult sometimes to know the, to calculate the first and last responses. So there's, there comes another block with uh, another monitoring, which is, I'll tell later. So this is with a non-depolarizing block. And with this train of four, we can also in the first, in this figure, if we look at this figure, if I, if I tell somebody, which muscle relaxants that I have used uh, without telling anybody that I have used succinyl choline or I have used uh, rocuronium, whatever. If I tell somebody, can you please tell me which kind of muscle relaxant that am I using? If the person has a monitor and if he sees this, then he can very well tell whether it is a depolarizing or non-depolarizing drugs by, by only seeing the uh, response of the muscle. If, if it is goes all together, it is a depolarizing block. And if it is goes with fade, it is a non-depolarizing block. That is another uh, beautiful thing that we can monitor with the uh, train of four or with monitoring neuromuscular block. Okay. 
But what we cannot do with train of four, we cannot, we, we will see when the block occurs, there is all the four are gone. When all the four are gone, then we can see, we know that there is total block, but we will not be able to say whether it is 100% relaxations or not. Because we know that until and unless there is 70% of uh, receptors are uh, receptors are free, the muscle twitching does not come back. So even if it is all the four responses are not there, there may be 10%, 20%, 30% of the uh, receptors are free, even then the responses are not there. So we cannot say it is 100% uh, block or not. So for that reason, we have this post tetanic count. I, I, I'm coming to that later. Before that, we need to know what is tetanus. Tetanus is another type of stimulus that we give 50 hertz. It's 50 hertz for continuously for five seconds. This is known as tetanus. So what it what it causes at the start of the tetanic stimulation, large amounts of acetylcholine are released from the immediately available stores because we are giving highest 50 hertz for five seconds continuously. A stimulus it comes that there is no acetylcholine is there. So there's a continuous release of acetylcholine or almost all the acetylcholine are finished. And then occurs, then there is another thing that we need to know after tetanus what occurs, that is called post-tetanic facilitation. What is this post-tetanic facilitation? So after tetanus, when all the acetylcholine occurs, the nerve thinks that there's, there will be another impulse coming soon. And as a result, it produces acetylcholine like in flashes. So if there's another stimulus that, that we only give a single tweet, we will see there is an increase in the stimulus here in the response of the muscle. Whatever the muscle was responding normally, the response after tetanus stimulation will be increased. This is called a post tetanic facilitation. If we see here, these are the normal stimulus and when you give a tetanus, this is 50 hertz for five seconds, and the normal stimulus is again. So here the response for this normal stimulus, the normal responses, and when we give a tetanic stimulation, there's a little high because as I said, that the acetylcholine increases, and then the fade occurs, and there is nothing over here. And then when we give a single stimulus, the normal stimulus is that this, this responses like up to here but here we see a very high response because as i said it the nerve thinks that there will be another stimulus and there are plenty of acetylcholine present so whatever the stimulus comes the, there is plenty of acetylcholine release and the in this facilitation is more there is increased response and then after a few response it comes back to normal and this phenomenon is uh, used for the post tetanic count. This is called the post tetanic count. So after what happens in post tetanic count? So after giving a tetanic stimulation, we give a single impulse, single stimulus of one hertz, uh, at least three seconds after the end of the tetanic stimulation. And if we see any responses, because we, if there is any acetylcholine present or any uh, chance there is my, there is any receptors are present, then there's a acetyl, plenty of acetylcholine will occupy those receptors and there will be facilitation of the, stem, uh, of the response. So we'll, we'll get a very, a single stimulus. Uh, even if the if it is 100% of, if in, even if it is, there is nothing in the, in the train of four. So these are known as post tetanic counts. So if we get one uh, count, one uh, response, we, it, I will say it one PTC, and if we see two, three, four, we'll call it usually, usually four, when it is four 
the count PTC count is four. We usually four to six. We usually see the first response of the train of four. So this is the uh, way of understanding what is the difference between post tetanic count and train of four. Here, stimulation, tetanus, stimulation. There's nothing because we know that there is no in single twitches, we get no response. Even if we give the train of four here, we'll get no response. But after tetanus, we are getting response. So we, here we are getting one, two, three, four, five, almost five. So we can call it PTC is five. And if we give a train of four here, we can we will be able to see at maybe, maybe we'll be able to see one response. Uh, here we can see. So, so this PTC is required to know whether we have 100% block or not. Here, if the PTC, we can say it is one, there's not 100% block. The block is usually going down. So in case of neurosurgeries or in case of eye surgeries where we require 100% block, we should use the monitoring of PTC and we'll know whether if the PTC should be zero so that we'll know there's 100% block and there's no chance of patients any movement. Now there's another uh, thing, as I was saying, that is very, very, very difficult to, uh, in our open eyes to measure the train of four ratio, because to remember the first response with the fourth response and making the ratio is very difficult. So they have produced another uh, type of uh, monitoring, which is called is double burst stimulation. What is double burst stimulation? It is again two short bursts of 50 hertz tetanic stimulation separated by 750 milliseconds. Two short bursts of 50 hertz of tetanic stimulation separated by 750 milliseconds. So, so, and the square wave impulse is of around 0.2 milliseconds of each. So DBS can be of many types. When the DBS is three impulses, in each burst, it is called 3-3, three, three, or it can be three impulse and two impulse, it is, can, it is called 3-2. The DBS is like that, but usually DBS is 3-3. Three, three. The three short bursts, a gap of 70 milliseconds, and then a three burst again. So what happens in that case? Here we see usually see something like this. These are normal train of four, and this is DBS. In DBS, we see three bursts in a very short time. So the stimulus seems to be one, and the response is also seems to be one. So for this one, tetanus, for this one, tetanus, tetanic stimulation uh, of DBS, two short bursts, 750 milliseconds apart, we see a response like a, this A and B. So for train of four, we see something like this. We have to remember A, we have to forget these two and remember B and then get the ratio. But in double burst stimulation, we see only two responses and we can, we will know what is the ratio. And it is very easier for us, for naked eye, to know what is the uh, response. And this is usually, very important during the reversal time. We will know what the ratio is and uh, when we can start the reversal. So there are some factors for monitoring. Uh, these are choice of the muscle, which muscle we are using because we are, because the adductor policy is the most uh, outside. So it is very easier for us to see, but the muscles of diaphragm, the muscles of uh, larynx, the muscles of orbiculus or uh, culi, these are all different and they show different timing of block. And when we see a block in the adductor policies, by that time, the larynx are already totally blocked. So even if we don't see a total 100% block in adductor policies, the larynx are blocked. By the time we see 100% block, the larynx are by that time, so we can start intubation even if we don't see 100% block in the adductor policy. The muscle is different type. The diaphragm is also delayed. 
when the diaphragm started coming, the, by the time the larynx already comes back, uh, already reversed. This stimulation current, we see different currents for different monitoring, the temperature, the frequency, the stimulation wave. And uh, we have, all, I have already talked about the supramaximal stimuli, and I have also said that for supramaximal maximal stimulus, we have to give a very high dose of uh, high, uh, high amplitude of current because to, we want to produce the, we want to give the, release the total acetylcholine, but it is very painful. So there were many studies using submaximal stimulus. And it was shown that uh, in studies that submaximal stimulus also produces almost similar kind of responses as supramaximal. So it's not always required to produce a supramaximal uh, thing. For the pain thing, we can also use the submaximal square wave impulse stimulus. So what are the clinical importance of monitoring? As I've already said, monitoring of the onset, monitoring of the surgical relaxation, monitoring of the recovery, and monitoring also in the intensive care. I've already said that, I don't want to go through it again. Now I'm going to reversal. Reversal of the neuromuscular block that we have already produced. Now, Reversal depends on the drugs that we are using. Before that, muscle relaxation is caused by occupation of the acetylcholine receptor by depolarizing or non-depolarizing drugs. And depolarizing drugs have intrinsic activity of the receptors, which causes persisting depolarization, and then it reverses itself in the acetylcholine increases, acetylcholine, uh, the uh, anticholinic uh, acetyl transfer that destroys it and the, it comes back to repolarization again. In case of plasma cholinesterase, in fact, the non-depolarizing drugs, what happens? It is a competitive type of block, as we know. It is competes with acetylcholine for the alpha receptors. And we need to remove these things from the uh, receptors so that acetylcholine can go there and the normal action can be done. Should reversal be routine? Many anesthesiologists advocate the routine administration of reversal agents at the end of anesthesia. Why? Besides an increase in acetylcholine at the recurtinic neuromuscular junction, however, there is also increase at the muscle. Uh, even if uh, the reversal agents that we use is uh, acts not only on nicotinic receptors but also on the muscarinic receptors so some advocates that should not be used routinely so as i have already mentioned in my ideal neuromuscular block ideal neuromuscular agent there should not be a regular reversal and also if we monitor the patients uh, during our anesthesia, we sometimes may not require a reversal agent because reversal agents are not free from side effects. So reversal requires monitoring, as I've said, with all drugs, compound reversing neuromuscular blockage should be administered only on indication and monitoring the neuromuscular transmission. These two is very important, monitoring and indication. So indication for reversal is reversal of residual relaxation. We want to finish the relaxation and make the patients normal again. And if there is uh, there's deep neuromuscular block, we have given plenty of muscle relaxants and there is deep neuromuscular block, we cannot intubate. So we need to reverse all those cases. We need that. So we need all this monitoring, train of four, double burst, train of four count. Monitoring 
we have two types again we can use monitoring devices and also there is some bedside clinical signs that are used ability to sustain a head lift for five seconds assessment of hand grip strength ability to open eyes widely for five seconds assessment of quality of speaking voice ability to touch teeth and ability to protrude the tongue. these are the bedside monitoring so if we all see that we know that the patient is okay we can reverse the patient we can uh, extubate the patient with or without giving the reversal so what's the main thing in uh, reversal actually this is lowering the relaxant concentration that we are using and increase the acetylcholine concentration so lowering the relaxant concentration we stop giving relaxant during the end of the surgery it the relaxant that are metabolized and these are the concentration reduces and we want to increase the acetyl concentration so we give the reversal agent the new stigmines to which increases the acetyl concentration in the neuromuscular joint the reversal agents are neostigmine, pyridoxstigmine, hydrophonium, the, but the regular use that we use is neostigmine. Uh, we have a newer one. I'll talk about that later. We know how anticholinesterase pharmacology occurs. These are enzyme inhibition, presynaptic effects. These are presynaptic. The neostigmine also produces its own block. If you use a huge amount of neostigmine, it produces, it uh, occupies the receptor and it produces its own block. And it has actions on the muscarinic receptors and all those actions. The complications that anticholinesterase have are ne neuromuscular block, the cardiovascular effects, the inventory effects, the respiratory effects. We we all know know that. So, what are the factors that affect the reversal? Mainly the intensity of block. At what level of block the patient is in because if it is in a deep block it's very difficult to reverse the patient with anticholinesterases the doors of the reversal agent we have to give a very large dose which can produce its own side effects and the relaxant that we have used choice of the relaxant whether we have used it bolus or in infusion or the patient is an intense block and there is always the age factor is always there There are some drug interactions with the muscle relaxants. In some special situations, the muscle relaxants actions different that I've already told, renal failure, acid base changes, muscle disorders. Okay, recent developments. The, for the search for an ideal muscle relaxants continues. So now they have, made some new progress in the compounds of chlorofumarates as a new neuromuscular blocking drug and a substance known as calabadion and L-cysteine adduction for the reversal of neuromuscular block. These are two, two new drugs. I'll tell this about something about it. The drug is, the first drug is known as gantacurium. Gantacurium is an asymmetric and anterioromedic isopolinium diastar diester of chlorofumaric acid. It is very ultra-short-acting, non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drug with a rapid onset and wide safety margin. It is metabolized by chemical degradation, which involves first cysteine adduction. Cysteine adduction is a fast process and also pH-sensitive hydrolysis, which is a slow process. The metabolites of gantacurium showed no neuromuscular properties, which is required. And moreover, there is no renal and hepatic involvement in elimination of the gantacurium. This is one thing that is very important for patients which have renal and hepatic disorders. In human volunteers, the ED95 of gantacurium was 0.19 milligram per kg, and the onset of action with one ED95 is less than three minutes. But it could be shortened. Onset of action here means the time to intubation. Onset of action could be shortened to 1.5 minutes by increasing the dose into 4 into ED95. Uh, but at the dose of 4 into ED95, the duration of action is again increased to 15 minutes or more 
So we cannot call it an ideal muscle reaction. If the duration of action is 15 minutes, it is again very difficult for us to maintain the uh, mass, uh, mask anesthesia if we cannot ventilate the patient. But gantogram is again spontaneous recovery is there. Uh, gantogram induced neuromuscular is rapid. But again, if we use, if we want to use the, uh, decrease the onset time, the duration increases, but which is required, decreasing of onset time is required, but increase in duration is not required. So there is problem. And the other thing is, for gantaturium, even if it is a non-depolarizing block, we can reverse it with cholinesterase inhibitors. But as we know, the action of neostigmine is very uh, the, the onset of action of neostigmine is seven to fifteen minutes. So for gantaturium, by seven to fifteen minutes, it, it is usually uh, spontaneously recovered. So Edrophonium, on the other hand, the onset is very uh, fast. So edrophonium we should be using for gantaturium. There's another drug, CW002. It is again a benzyl isoconium fumarate diester. And another one, CW011. This is a non-halogenated oliphenic diester analog of gantaturium. This is of intermediate action. The other one is also of intermediate action. Mm. Okay, let's skip this. So the current problems in reversal, what we have. Saxomethanium has rapid onset and offset. This is an ideal, but it has many side effects and often contraindicated. So saxomethanium, even if it is a drug of choice for rapid sequence intubation, we cannot use it regularly for its side effects and contraindications. So what would be an alternative for its rapid sequence intubation in that case? Rocurinium has a rapid onset, but in cannot, if, if there is a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situation, even after giving rocurinium, the situation return to spontaneous breathing is too slow. It, it, it is around 15 to 20 minutes, or if we use 3 into ED95, then it is maybe 25 minutes. So a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate patient is, uh, will be very dangerous in case of ocurinium and uh, if we cannot reverse it. The reversal of profound neuromuscular block is not possible post operative recurrization versus inadequate block, it both happens. If we use more, there may be PORC, and if we use less, there is inadequate blockage. Lack of neuromuscular monitoring, despite recommendations, we, recommendation is monitoring, but we usually don't monitor, so there is a POR, increased PORC regularly, and reversal with neostimine hydroponium, there's uh, the side effects of neostigmine and hydrophorium are always there. So what is the answer? The answer is Sogamadex. This is a gamma cyclodextrin molecule composed of eight glucose molecules forming a ring. And it is designed to encapsulate the amino steroid neuromuscular blocking agent, that is rocurinium mainly. Sogamadex is a competitive antagonist of rocurinium Vecuronium and pancuronium. It is highest react acts against uh, rocuronium, then vecuronium, then pancuronium. It just engulfs the rocuronium. It just eats up the rocuronium in the plasma, not in the neuromuscular junction, but in the plasma. So, Gomadex binds rocuronium very tightly and irreversibly in a one into one ratio, forming an hydrogen soluble complex. So, the rocuronium is gone from the system immediately. So Gamadex has this action in the plasma, as I have said, not in the neuromuscular junction. Rocurinium is encapsulated in the plasma. Concentration gradient between free rocurinium in the plasma and rocurinium at a neuromuscular junction differs because the plasma rocurinium is gone. There is no rocurinium in the 
available rocuronium for the neuromuscular junction. And rocuronium diffuses away from the junction to the plasma where it is chelated by sumama dextrin. So we see here neostigmine acts only here, but sugamadex acts on the plasma. It takes away the uh, rocuronium from junction and eats it here in the plasma and its concentration is lower. So how fast it acts? Compare time to recovery of TOF4 0.9, which is 90% recovery in TOF, TOF. Rocuronium is given 0.6 milligram per kg, which is actually 3 into ED95, followed by Sugamadex 2 milligram per kg. And if we use Cisatracurium 0.15 milligram per kg, followed by new stigmine 50 microgram per kg. The reversal time to recovery, Rocuronium Sugamadex is only 1.9 minutes. So even if we give the intubation dose ED93 into ED95 of rocurinium and give sugarmahadex at a dose of 2 milligram, the time to recovery is 1.9 minutes only. But for neostigmine, it is 9 minutes. So as I've said, the Time comes from 52 minutes to 1.8 minutes. If we do, if we use sugama dex, if we increase the dose of sugama dex to 8 milligram, the time can be reduced to 1.8 minutes. Is sugama dex safe? Yes, it's very safe because though no serious adverse effects have been reported to date, there's some QT increase and some BP fall, which are may, um, not minimal. Rocuronium sugamadex excreted mainly in the urine. Uh, but again, if there is renal failure, what happens? The studies are going on, but not uh, doesn't actually affect, not known if no known effect of the receptor system, no need for antimuscarinic or cardiovascular stability, equally effective under maintenance of anesthesia with fall or sibofluorine. So application, more rapid reversal than anticholinal steroids and more rapid turnaround. We don't have to wait for the patients to come back from its neuromuscular block. We can do it just like that in two minutes, in 1.5 minutes. Larger doses of rocurinium can be used with confidence. We can use a larger dose of rocurinium. If we have sugamadex in our hand and we want to reduce the onset time or we want to integrate the patients in 60 seconds, we can use uh, a large volume of rocuronium, we can in intubate, and if we cannot intubate, we have sugamadex, so we can use sugamadex to bring back the patients in 1.5 minutes. So it's very safe and it advantage in case of profound block also, and it is rapid onset of set of rocuronium sugamadex. And if we have sugamadex, Rocuridium can actually replace saxamethanium for rapid sequence intubation. So in conclusion, we can say for sugamadex, sugamadex is a more efficacious reversal agent of rocuridium than anticholinesterases. Replacement of anticholinesterases is possible with this. Saxamethanium may be replaced for rapid sequence intubation by rocuridium, of course, if we have sugamadex. And routine use of sugamadex will depend upon economic consideration. There's one thing, sugamadex is a little expensive. We, uh, I think we'll be in Bangladesh, sugamadex will be available very shortly. One dose of two milligram per kg of sugamadex will cost around 2,500 or something like that in Bangladesh. And as I was saying, two other uh, reversal agents which are in studies are Calabadion 1 and Calabadion. Calabadion 1 is the first generation Calabadion and is able to reverse neuromuscular block without binding affinity of sugamadex to rocuronium. Uh, in fact, it acts as same as sugamadex, uh, the Calabadion 1, and Calabadion 2 showed 89 fold higher binding affinity to rocuronium compared to sugamadex. So if Calabadion 2 is in the market, where if and when it comes, it will again be a much 
better option than sumamadeus. And the other thing, Calabardian 2 is will be equally uh, responsible to accept, encapsulate the amino steroids and also benzyl isoquinine and neuromuscular drugs. Sugamadex, and on the other hand, only encapsulates the amino steroids. Thank you.